Greeting citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we can meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day today, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Brattersea, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing the murder of 56-year-old Cheryl Miranda. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you, specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. All right, now that I'm done begging you to join my cult, we can go ahead and get into this video. So this video is on a case that, you guessed it, I learned about while researching another case. And at first I was worried there wasn't going to be enough information to put a video together for this case, because truly, there really isn't that much information out there in terms of like newspaper articles and things like that. And there aren't a lot of interviews with people, friends, and family members of Cheryl Miranda's. And honestly, I get the impression that's because a lot of people weren't asking. And what I mean by that is that the media just wasn't really covering it. It's not one of those cases that was sensational and grabbed their attention, which kind of blows my mind because to read about this, I felt compelled. Like I had to look into it further and I had to learn all I could. And once I did, I was like, wow, this is absolutely horrifying. And I cannot believe that more people aren't talking about this. So today I'm going to tell you the entire story. I read all the things so that you do not have to. And at the end of this video, I want you to answer the question of the day. I'm going to give it to you now so you can have it kicking around in your brain as we go through the details. But of course, I want you to answer once you have some information to go on. But the question of the day is this. I actually have two. One, what do you believe was the motive for the murder of Cheryl Miranda? And two, do you believe that both parties that were arrested and convicted of her murder were actually involved in her murder? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below after we go through the details of this case. And now with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the murder of 56-year-old Cheryl Miranda. Our story today begins in the early morning hours of March 4th, 2005. It was during this time that a police officer was doing their normal route, like driving around in an unincorporated area of Fulton County, Georgia, when all of a sudden he looked off into the distance, he saw that there were flames coming from an area on the 500 block of Welcome All Road. And this road was one of like the main roads that went through the historic college park. And it was like a quiet little residential area. The officer drove over to see what was going on, right? And that's when he found that there was a truck on fire. So he called in for paramedics, for fire department, for more police officers, all of that. And luckily, there was actually a fire station just down the street from where this was happening. So the turnaround to get more professionals, fire professionals there was pretty quick. So they show up, the fire is put out and police officers are on the scene. And at first they're kind of taking it in in pieces and they think like something looks off here because they can tell even before it was tested and confirmed that an accelerant was probably used to set the truck on fire because there was like a poor pattern on the outside of the door. But when they looked in the cab of the truck, they were like, okay, there's nobody in here. So at least that's something they could take a breath. At least it wasn't them trying to like burn up a body. But then they started taking the scene more fully. This is because they made their way to the bed of the truck. And once they got to the bed of the truck, it became very clear why somebody had set this truck on fire because laying in the bed of the truck was the badly burned and blackened body of a person. The person was so burned that they were unrecognizable. They had third degree burns over like 95% of their body and they had no features left whatsoever. And because the truck had been set on fire and the cab burned, if there had been identification on this person or in the vehicle, it was long gone. And it was so bad. Like when I say they were unrecognizable, you couldn't even tell a gender or like a race. They were so burned up. So they really thought they were going to have an issue with identification because the truck was so burned up. They didn't even think they were going to be able to get forensic evidence. The fire was hot and heavy and it moved very quickly. And it was so hot that you couldn't even open the door of the truck. Like it was welded shut. But somehow, despite this fast rapid burning and everything being so just like charred, somehow the license plate was almost completely untouched. So they had their first break, right? They ran the plates and they found that the truck was registered to a 56 year old veteran named Cheryl Miranda, who was actually from Tampa, Florida. So not Georgia where her body was found. So this is obviously helpful, but at that time they couldn't even confirm that this was Cheryl in the truck. Yes, it was registered to her, but could her truck have been stolen? Like there were so many scenarios that could have been where the person in the truck wasn't Cheryl Miranda. They didn't even know if she was missing yet. So in the meantime, they need to send the body off for autopsy so they could tell one, who this person was, and two, what happened here. 
During the autopsy, they were able to determine that death had happened about two to four days prior to the body being set on fire. And they were also able to tell that the fire was not the cause of death because when they looked, there was no like smoke or soot or anything in the lungs. So she was not breathing. On top of that, they were able to tell that this person had clearly gone through hell because her cause of death ended up being two different things. And this was blunt force trauma to the head and a stab wound to the neck. This person was found with their wrists bound with rope and with a belt tied around their neck. And they were able to tell by the autopsy, and this is really horrible, that this person had been alive for most of their attack. So the beating, the blunt force trauma, the stab to the neck, she had been alive for most of this. They were also able to determine that yes, this was the body of Cheryl Miranda, and they were able to identify her by her fingerprints because Cheryl had been in the military, so her fingerprints had been taken. And she was so burned up that you would think there wouldn't be fingerprints, but somehow one fingerprint remained and they were able to match it to Cheryl. So now officers in Georgia needed to contact officers in Florida to try to put the puzzle pieces together of who would have done this to Cheryl and why. Cheryl Miranda was one of two daughters and she was born in 1948 in Providence, Rhode Island. I'm not exactly sure how old Cheryl was when her parents divorced, but I know that it happened when she was young. And from what I can tell, she had a pretty good relationship when she was younger with both parents, but she was way closer, particularly close with her father and really looked up to him and the two did everything together. Cheryl was said to be bright, outgoing, full of life. She was said to be like one of those people that was genuinely kind with a super soft, good heart. And her friends said that she was just like so, so much fun across the board. She was just described as an incredibly fun person. And the words that her friends used to describe her were quote, happy, friendly, warm, funny, wacky, gentle, and delightful. Delightful. I love that. If only we could all just be described as being delightful after we're gone. I feel like that's what we should be aiming for. It's just being delightful people. Now, as I said, growing up, Cheryl and her family were super close. And I guess when she was younger, she like lived close to the water. Her family lived close to the shore. So something that she really, really loved and like reminisced on later is that she would walk down to the water during the day and she'd go fishing. This is something she liked to do. She would go fishing. She would catch some fish. She'd bring them home and her whole family would eat whatever she caught for dinner. And this was just something that later in life she would always think about and like, remember fondly that these experiences with her family, which sounds just super pure, right? But there were some things about Cheryl's life and her relationship with her family that just was not quite so pure. So Cheryl was a gay woman and she came out to her family as being gay and being, you know, I like women when she was an adult and her family just wasn't super accepting of this. And that that's the part that's not pure. The fact that her family didn't accept that she was gay, not that her being gay is unpure, just in case that wasn't clear. But her family, once they learned about it, they kind of had this mindset of like, we know, but we're not going to talk about it. And this was definitely hard for her, especially since she had been so close with them. And I assume she would have thought that they would have accepted her no matter what. So she developed like a pretty thick skin because of this. And she was a little bit guarded because she was very like proud of who she was. So it was disappointing that her family wasn't proud with her. In the late 60s, Cheryl joined the military and she actually served in the Vietnam War and she was said to be just a tremendous soldier. And once she was able to leave Vietnam and like retire from the military, leave the military, whatever you do when you're no longer in the military, she decided she wanted to put roots down in Tampa, Florida. So she moves there and it's while there she actually meets and gets into a really serious relationship with a woman. And this was like a very big deal. This woman was said to be like the love of her life. And she thought this was like her forever partner. This is actually her first girlfriend that she got after coming out. So it was a super huge deal and they were together for a while. And then out of nowhere, it's so weird. Everybody says it came out of nowhere and nobody knew why her and this girl broke up and it was kind of devastating for Cheryl. And it was a heartbreak that she never seemed to get over. And if that wasn't bad enough, around the same time as this breakup, Cheryl learned that her father, who she was super close with, even though the relationship was, you know, a little strained because of the lack of acceptance, she like loved her father. She learned that he was terminally ill. So all of this happening at one time was very hard on Cheryl and it changed her personality quite a bit. She got a little more recluse. She used to go out, she had friends and she used to go out and do things. And now she just wanted to stay home. She didn't want to be social. And a love life seemed like something she was just completely uninterested in. So she was just living a quiet life. She was receiving a military pension on top of working at like a printing company. So she was making a decent amount of money, just doing the thing, minding her own business. When all of a sudden she's found murdered, burned up in the back of her own truck in another state. 
So police in Georgia, like local to the crime scene, get in contact with police in Florida. Hello, Florida police. We need you to go and check out Cheryl's apartment. So Florida police head over to Cheryl's apartment obviously. And they get permission from the landlord to actually enter the apartment. So they don't have to kind of, you know, wait for like a search warrant. They can actually go in. And when they get inside, everything looks normal. It doesn't look like it's a crime scene. It doesn't look like there was an altercation. There's no blood. Nothing's turned over. Everything seems, you know, normal. Okay. They talk to neighbors. Neighbors are like, we didn't hear anything. Nothing happened. We just haven't seen her in a while. They contact her family who are still in Rhode Island. And they say they haven't talked to her in like a really long time. With that not being super helpful, police get Cheryl's cell phone records because they're like, okay, maybe we can learn something here. And they see that she has several missed calls and voicemails from a friend of hers named Teresa. And Teresa was actually the last person to contact Cheryl before her phone started heading from Florida to Georgia. So they're like, maybe she knows something. They get in contact with her and they let her know like, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your friend is dead. And she was just devastated, dude. Once she was, you know, calm enough to talk to police, she really didn't have a ton of information to give them. She just told them like her and Cheryl were good friends and that Cheryl was actually supposed to come and see her the day before she just disappeared. Nobody heard from her again. She was going to come to her house and watch some like award show or something like that on TV, but she never showed up. So she was calling her over and over like, are you coming? Like, where have you been? Where are you? But she hadn't gotten a hold of her. And the only information that really gave police anything to go on was just the fact that despite the fact that Cheryl kind of seemed cool on having a love life, she did have a girlfriend at the time named Tanya. Obviously at this, police wanted to try to talk to Tanya, but when they try to locate her, it turns out she's missing too. So they're kind of like, what the is going on? Like, could she be another victim? They search old addresses, find no sign of her. They also, you know, had searched Cheryl's apartment and supposedly Tanya and Cheryl had lived together at this point. It was a more serious girlfriend, which we'll get into a little bit later, but she wasn't there either. So they don't really know what to do at this point. That's not to say that police didn't have anything to go on because they did have a suspect or at least a person of interest right from the very beginning. And this was a lady who I believe her name was Betsy. And she became somebody that police were interested in because she had called Cheryl's phone after Cheryl had gone missing and the, there had actually been a connection. There had been a phone call. So police go to her place to try to talk to her, see what's going on. And she is not cooperative at all. She's like, I don't want to talk to you. I want nothing to do with this. All she tells them is I have no idea who the Cheryl lady is. And if you want to talk to me again, you need to talk to my attorney. And they thought it was very strange that like immediately, like upon just being questioned, she was like, talk to my attorney. Don't talk to me. And they just found that to be odd. Like, why would you need an attorney so fast? And on top of that, they end up trying to call her back later to try to get more information from her. And they find that she had actually changed her phone number. So because they can't get a hold of her on the phone, they actually go to her home again. And they're like, okay, we're going to just go and ask her questions in person. And when they get there, she's not there, but they are able to speak to her husband. And her husband tells them that like, listen, Betsy has a pretty bad drug dependency issue. And I'm actually in the process of trying to divorce her. He wanted to get out of the relationship. So this looks super weird to police because now they're wondering if somehow Cheryl could have been caught up in some sort of drug situation since this lady Betsy had a drug dependency issue and she was being super sketchy about Cheryl and changing her phone number and disappearing. And even her husband didn't know where she was and police could not locate her. So at this point they had to just put a pin in her to come back to her later. So basically it seems like police are just kind of moving down her list of like her cell phone records. So first they talk to Teresa, who's the person who had been calling her over and over, right? Then they move to the last person who spoke to Cheryl or called Cheryl's phone after Cheryl went missing. So now they're going to another person. This is the person who last talked to Cheryl before she went missing. So this would have been before her phone left on this long random trip to Georgia that nobody could understand why she was going there in the first place. And this person was somebody named Josette and she became very important to the investigation. So police meet with Josette and she is very helpful to them. She answers questions for them. So they actually have an idea of what's going on. Like for example, why she was in Georgia in the first place. So she tells police that on the day that she went missing, Cheryl was moving sort of, she was planning to relocate from Florida to Alabama, but she wasn't moving there just yet. Basically what was happening is Josette, who was like an old friend of Cheryl's for many, many years, her mother lived in Alabama. So Cheryl was going to be driving from Tampa to Alabama to go and kind of check out the site, stay there for a little bit and see if this felt like a place that could be her forever home because she just wanted to get out of Florida and start somewhere new. So she wanted to see if this was going to be her place. But another thing she tells police that is very interesting is that she's not going alone. 
Cheryl's not traveling alone. She's bringing a couple of friends with her who she is dropping off in Georgia along the way. Unfortunately, Josette did not know the names of the friends that she was going to be taking with her to Georgia, but she did say that she had met one of these people one time, and this was a young black man. But that's the only information that she had. So this was huge for police because prior to this, they were like, there was this mystery, like why did she end up in Georgia? And now they were finding that she was there on purpose. This wasn't random, this was intentional. And now they knew that she wasn't traveling alone, but the issue was they needed to find out who these people were. They then continue moving down the list of Cheryl's phone records and they come to another person. And this is a person who Cheryl's phone had called the day she disappeared and had also received several calls from Cheryl during her trip from Tampa to Georgia. And this was linked to a woman named Erica. So police get Erica's number. They call her. Obviously they get it from Cheryl's phone records. They call her and they're like, Hey, why was Cheryl calling you? Like, why was this number calling you during this time? Now this is when they get some real information because Erica then tells police like, oh yes, I know what you're talking about, but I wasn't talking to Cheryl. I was actually talking to my nephew Jabaris. He's who called me from that phone number, but I do know who Cheryl is because Cheryl has been dating my aunt Tanya. And hearing this, police are like, okay, we really need to look into Jabaris and Tanya, figure out what's going on. Cause it feels like all the puzzle pieces are coming together, but we're still missing something here. So let's you and I, cause we know and it, when they're doing this, they don't know what's going on, but I know. So I'm now going to tell you what's going on. So let's talk about Tanya. Let's talk about Cheryl. Let's talk about Jabaris. Let's talk about that dynamic real quick. So apparently, despite the fact that many of Cheryl's friends and family members didn't think she was interested in having a love life, her, Cheryl and Tanya were dating and Cheryl had just kind of kept this more private. She didn't let it be as well known as her last relationship had been maybe so that if it ended, it wouldn't be such a public thing and she could kind of grieve privately and not have to deal with people. I don't know, but she had kind of kept this relationship secret, but that's not to say that this relationship wasn't a big deal because it definitely was. It was serious. It was passionate. It was intense. The two like literally lived together and had kind of built a little life together. So when Tanya and Cheryl met, they really hit it off, despite the fact that they had a lot of differences between the two of them. One, Tanya was a bit younger than Cheryl. And two, she had just had a very different upbringing and a different relationship with her family and just a whole different start to life than Cheryl had. Tanya had grown up around Atlanta and she grew up in a large, close and loving family. Tanya had previously been with a man. Her and this guy had got together when she was in her twenties and they had two children together, a son and a daughter. Tanya was happy, or at least she, she should have been like on paper. She had a partner, she had her kids, she had a close family, she had a good life, but deep down she knew that she was conflicted because she realized that she was gay. She didn't want to be with a man. She wanted to be with a lady. So the relationship she had with this man, her kid's father ended up ending and she came out of the closet to her family and she kind of got a mixed reaction. Some people were kind of not sure how they felt about it, but some people were, you know, pretty chill about it. But her biggest supporter, the person who was there for her, super supportive, super loving in 100% was her son Javaris. He was like, you are my mom. I don't give a fuck. Like, it's cool. You like women? Me too. So at some point after that, Tanya and her son Jabaris, who was 18 at this point, decided they were going to move together. Well, Tanya decided she was going to move, but Jabaris was 18, so he could do whatever he wanted, but he decided he wanted to go with his mother. So the two moved from Atlanta, Georgia, yes, cool, and moved to Tampa, Florida, where they put down their roots. And Tanya ended up getting a job in a cafeteria, and shortly after the two moved there, Tanya met Cheryl, the two hit it off, they got into a relationship, it got very serious, very fast, with both Tanya and Jabaris moving into Cheryl's home, because Tanya and her son were a package deal. They were super happy, and the few people that knew them as a couple said they were super loving with each other, at least at first. So issues developed over time, which is normal in a long-term relationship. Things are not going to be roses forever. It's how you deal with these issues that I think matters. And the way that these issues were dealt with wasn't great. So one of the big things was that Cheryl didn't really love Jabaris living with them. And it's not that she didn't like Jabaris or wouldn't want one of Tanya's kids to live with them. It's just that Jabaris, who was an adult at this point, wasn't really contributing the way an adult should. He wasn't going out and getting a job. He wasn't helping with the household. He was just kind of laying around and doing nothing. And this would already bother anyone, right? But Cheryl was also in the military. So she was pretty like strict on how things should be because that's the environment she was, you know, blossomed from. Sure. So this was a problem for her. 
So this caused tension, right? It caused tension between Jabaris and Cheryl, which in turn caused tension between Tanya and Cheryl. And this tension would just build and they'd start to fight a lot. And eventually these fights started to get physical. The relationship got to the point that it was very abusive with Tanya being the aggressor against Cheryl. And it got so bad that Cheryl called the police several times to report domestic violence against her from Tanya. And it got so bad that in, I think it was May of 2004, Cheryl actually applied for two restraining orders against Tanya. And Tanya even violated one of these restraining orders. And it's so crazy. Like it's so it's frustrating because it seems like it was avoidable and it seems like Cheryl knew what was happening and knew where this relationship was headed because in one of these restraining orders, she straight up said, quote, Tanya threatens to kill me, threatens to stab me, beat me. And I'm in fear, great fear for my life. In this order, Cheryl said that she had kicked Tanya out, right? She got this restraining order. She kicked her out and that Tanya had broken into her house. She had broken in through a sliding glass door and then started to beat Cheryl, like punching her in the back of the head. And she said that she was scared because she knew that Tanya had weapons, right? She knew that Tanya had swords, knives, and guns. It was just bad. Cause I guess in addition to the issues with just like Jabaris and the tension with that, Tanya also had like a real jealousy and possessiveness issue over Cheryl. So this would cause a lot of their problems. Cheryl would call, she'd get the restraining order. The police would come and tell Tanya to leave and she would, and then the police would leave and Tanya would come back, which would violate the restraining order. And then she, you know, got another one. That's why she had two restraining orders, which I don't understand why that needs to be. Someone violates the restraining order. You think they just take them to jail, but she instead got a second restraining order. Make it make sense for me. Cause I don't get it. Well, I say make it make sense, but I think I understand in some ways, whether it, I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong. I'm saying that I think I understand why police didn't do anything. And it's because this relationship had the classic cycles of an abusive relationship where they would be good. And then Tanya would get bad and she would abuse her and Cheryl would call the cops and Tanya would be asked to leave. But then Tanya would come back and she would love bomb Cheryl and Cheryl would take her back and things would be good for a little while. And then the whole cycle would start all over again. Like it got so bad that eight months before Cheryl was murdered, she and Tanya got into a fight at a nightclub. And this fight resulted in Tanya knocking out one of Cheryl's teeth. After this fight, Cheryl ended up calling Josette. Now you remember Josette is the friend that told police about the fact that Cheryl was going on the road trip with Tanya. So she calls Josette because Josette's like her close friend. They've been friends for like 30 years and Josette's a bit younger. So she refers to Cheryl as her aunt and Josette drives over because Cheryl's like, I need to be picked up. I'm at this nightclub. And when she gets there, she sees that Cheryl's all, all messed up. She has a busted lip. She's missing a tooth and her glasses are broken. And so she looks at her and she's like, what happened to you, dude? Like what happened? And she just says, I got in a fight with Tanya. So that's who we're talking about here. This is the person that Cheryl is driving to Georgia because I guess what happened is that Jabaris and Tanya were living with Cheryl at this time, but Cheryl had broken up with Tanya and told her like, I'm moving out of state. This is over. I'm moving out of state. And this is why she was taking Tanya and Jabaris to Georgia along the way. So they'd have somebody, you know, somewhere to live. And she was just doing them a kindness. So now we're back to the investigation and police are still talking to Erica. And you remember Erica is one of Tanya's sisters who, you know, Jabaris had called her on the phone while they were driving. So police ask her like, okay, it was your nephew Jabaris. Well, what was he calling for? What was the, you know, subject of this conversation? And she says that Jabaris had called her because he needed gas money, that he was on his way from Florida to Georgia and they didn't have any gas. So they needed some money. And she said that she could hear in the background while she was talking to Jabaris, she could hear Tanya like telling him what to ask. Now she says that she didn't give them any money, but she knew that they made it to town anyway, that they were already in Georgia because they were actually staying with another one of Tanya's sisters. And this was a woman named Martina. So police are like, okay, where does Martina live? And once she tells them where Martina lives, they're like, oh, that's very interesting. Cause Martina lives on the same street that police found a burned up truck containing Cheryl's body. Now, Martina, police would have already gone to Martina's house, even if Erica hadn't said this, because they did see that there were some calls from Cheryl's phone to Martina. They just didn't know that Tanya and Jabaris were staying there. So this was good information. So they go over to Martina's house, knock on the door. Hello, Martina. Can I please speak with Tanya and Jabaris? And she tells them that like, they're not there right now, that they're not there anymore, but that she's willing to talk to them. So they talk to her and she tells them that yes, they had called her while they were on their way from 
Florida to Georgia, and that they had stayed with her a couple of days, but that they were acting super weird. She tells police that the truck that had been burned up, the truck the police had found burned up, had been in Jabaris and Tanya's possession. It had been parked in the same spot in her apartment complex for like a couple of days. And that the night before the vehicle was found burned up on Welcome All Road, yeah, on Welcome All Road, she had woke up in the middle of the night, like, I don't know, like three o'clock in the morning because she had a newborn baby actually. So, you know, if you know, you know. Luckily, I'm not in that life anymore. We've come out on the other side and homeboy sleeps through the night. Thank you. But she was still in the phase where the baby needs to be fed over and over and over. So she wakes up, she's feeding her baby and she realizes that Jabaris is not in the house in the middle of the night. So she kind of like looks out the window and she sees that the white truck is also gone. So she kind of wakes up Tanya and is like, where's Jabaris? Where's this truck? What's going on? And Tanya just tells her like, don't worry about it. Like mind your own business. Uh, he's taking the truck back to who it belongs to. And this would all seem fine and well, a weird interaction, but sure, no big deal. Except for the next day, she's watching the news and she sees this truck that had been in Jabaris and Tanya's possession had been found on fire. And then she hears that a body was found burned up in the truck. So she goes to Tanya and is like, what the fuck, bro? And Tanya again is like, you just need to mind your own business. Okay. Okay. And she's like, actually, what I need is for you to get the fuck out of my house. So she kicks them out and they go to stay with yet another one of Tanya's sisters. And this was a woman named Tamala. I know there are a lot of names here. They're just like bouncing around. She's got a lot of family. I told you she grew up in a big family. So police then head to Tamala's and now they got a rest on the brain because they feel like at this point, Tanya and Jabars have to be involved in some capacity. So they get to Tamala's house. But at that point, Tanya's not there, just Jabaris is. But they're like, you know what? you'll do. And they take him into custody. And they ask T Tamala, my brain, Tamala, if they can like search the house. And she's like, sure. Here are the bags they came with, get their stuff and get it out of here. I don't know what's going on, but I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to hear. This is all their stuff. So they now know what bags these two have been like traveling with. Police got a warrant and they went through those bags and they found all kinds of stuff like uh, Cheryl's cell phone, her credit cards, pawn shop tickets that were issued to her in mid-February, and a bunch of documents with Tanya's name on them. They also found a decorative knife or like letter opener and a pair of nunchucks that had belonged to Cheryl that she had displayed like on her mantle back in Florida. So Jabaris, who's like 20 years old at this point, is arrested. And the first question they have for him is like, where's your mom? And he's like, you know what? She went back to Florida, but police try to locate her in Florida and they can't find her. In the meantime, they're like, okay, let's question Jabaris. And they ask him, you know, all the things you would think they would ask him. And he denies everything at first, says he had no idea what happened to Cheryl. He liked Cheryl. He loved Cheryl. But then eventually after like two hours of being aggressively grilled, he's like, okay, I did drive Cher Cheryl. It is CH. I did drive Cheryl's truck from Florida to Georgia, but I didn't think she would mind because like we're close, we're homies and it's fine. And then he's like, and once I got here, once I was here, I found Cheryl's body in the bed of the truck. I had no idea it was there when we were driving. I don't know what happened, but I panicked because I was worried that there was a dead body in this truck and that I had been in it and my you know DNA and shit was all over the truck. So I did set it on fire. This is what he's telling them. He said basically that he drove the truck to a secluded area about a half mile away from his aunt's house and that he doused both the body and the truck in gasoline and then set it on fire. Police were like, okay, well, if your story is true, that means that your mom must have killed Cheryl, right? If you didn't do it, it must have been your mom. Was it your mom? And he was like, no, like he flat out would not admit it was his mother at all. He denied it and defended her 100% the entire time. Now, at this point, Tanya is in the wind, but again, police get lucky. And this is because Tamala, the one, the sister who Jabaris and Tanya had been staying with, actually called police and was like, hey, uh, she's back here if you want to come and get her too. So police actually go and they arrest 40 year old Tanya and they bring her in for questioning. But just like Jabaris in the beginning, at least she pretends to know nothing at all. All she will tell them is yes, her and Cheryl were roommates. They had lived together. And yes, Cheryl had kicked her out of the house. She also told them that Cheryl had went and pawned a bunch of her furniture and belongings, things that belonged to her, Tanya, not Cheryl. But she said, that's all there is to it. I know nothing of a murder. Now her interview was recorded and I saw some clips of her interview on like a YouTube video that was from an episode of the show snapped. And so you can kind of watch her be interviewed. And she's told that her son admitted to setting the truck on fire and she acts shocked. She's like, Oh my God, I can't believe it. I have failed as a mother. And then she also tells them that she doesn't know what's going on. Cause she never, she never was, she was never even 
in Cheryl's truck. But police don't believe her, and even without a confession, they arrest her. So Jabaris and Tanya were charged and tried for Cheryl's murder. And at trial, the two were tried. At trial, the two were tried. Yeah, they were tried together. And the case was like heavily circumstantial because there was no murder weapon. They didn't even have like a location where the murder took place and they didn't have a confession. So though it was circumstantial, they were like, what we do have is motive and opportunity. But they did what they could with what they had. The prosecution was like, listen, I'm going to tell you exactly what I think happened. And what I'm telling you is I don't actually think this murder was like planned. And when he says that he doesn't believe that this was planned, he doesn't think that the prosecutor, who I'm talking about here, doesn't think that Jabaris and Tanya like took this ride from Cheryl with the intent of murdering her on this ride. They think that Tanya and Cheryl got together to talk one more time because they had been in a relationship together and that Jabaris and Tanya really needed a ride to Georgia since they were going to need somewhere to live. So Cheryl agreed to take them. The prosecution believes that it was during the drive from Florida to Georgia that something happened that caused a fight between Tanya and Cheryl. And that when the fight happened, there was so much tension built up that the fight got physical and that Jabaris jumped in to like defend his mother. And they think that because of that, because of all this tension and all this unresolved issues and the breakup and all of this, that it got really out of hand and that overkill happened. And they think that they then took her, placed her in the bed of the truck, drove the rest of the way till they got to Georgia. And after a couple days, Tanya told her son, like, go clean up this mess. They believe that Tanya was mad. Tanya was mad that Cheryl had ended the relationship. Tanya was mad that Cheryl had filed restraining orders against her. And Tanya was mad that Cheryl, who was essentially their sort of cash cow of sorts, the person financially like taking care of them, they lived in her home, was now cutting them off from that financial stability. And they had a lot of evidence, those circumstantial evidence in their favor to support this. They had Cheryl's friends, including her long-term friend, Josette, testify at trial to what Cheryl would say about her abuse at the hands of Tanya. And they had Cheryl's own words in her restraining orders where she straight up told the court, like, this woman's going to kill me. They had the fact that Tanya had told her relatives that she, Jabars, and Cheryl had traveled together in the truck that was parked outside of the apartment building. And the fact that the family saw the truck parked outside four days and then noticed the truck and Jabaris were missing in the early hours of March 4th, 2005. And then the truck was found on fire near the apartment complex. And it was clear that it was intentional because it was covered in accelerant. The prosecution also had the cell phone records, which were extensive because Tanya and Jabaris were using this phone like it was their own. They called friends and family a bunch of times over the drive from Florida to Atlanta. Like it was said that there were like 33 different calls that were made by them in the two days after Cheryl went missing. And like, okay, to wrap up one loose end that I kind of didn't mention again later is you remember Betsy? You remember how Cheryl's phone called Betsy after Cheryl went missing and then Betsy was super cagey and weird. Well, it turns out that when this woman was like, I don't know who this Cheryl chick is, she was right because she didn't know Cheryl. She knew Chabaris, Chabaris, Jabaris. And she was only like cagey probably because she had like a drug issue and she thought the police were going to get her in trouble for something unrelated. Family confirmed that Tanya and Jabaris stayed in an apartment right next to the burn scene. And one relative was able to place both Jabaris and Tanya in the truck. Because remember, Tanya said she wasn't even there. But when Jabaris called a family member, this family member testified to the fact that they could hear Tanya in the background telling him what to say. And the same family member, I think it was, said that Jabaris told them that he had gotten into a fight with a lady in Florida, but he wouldn't elaborate on what happened. Then the medical examiner testified and the medical examiner let the court know just how severe the, the, the last moments of Cheryl's life were. They told the court that Cheryl suffered blunt force injuries to her head, including the fracturing of her skull, four sharp force injuries to the chin and neck, including the severing of her left jugular vein, which likely killed her and injuries indicating she had been strangled with the belt found around her neck. And no, they were never able to determine for sure what the murder weapon was or what the murder weapons were. They did point out that Tanya and Jabaris did have this knife slash letter opener and these nunchucks that were in their bag and that these weapons could have been used to cause these injuries. And the prosecution was like, listen, this was intense and crazy overkill that usually comes from somebody who has a personal relationship to the victim, just like the one that Tanya had with Cheryl. The court heard that Tanya was mad at Cheryl, mad that she had ended the relationship and mad that she was moving on with her life and moving out of state and that this anger had caused her and her son to just 
savagely beat and murder this woman and to cause one of the most brutal murders that this county had seen in years. And as for Jabaris, they believed that he did this because he just wanted to please and help his mother. They believed that he had a bit of resentment for Cheryl because Jabaris was the son that was always there for his mom, right? Very ride or die for his mom, very supportive of her, very like, he was the one who was there when she came out. He was the one that chose to move out of state with her. He was the one who moved in with her. But once she got with Cheryl, Tanya and Cheryl really spent the most time together and he didn't get as much attention he would want from his mother. And the prosecutor said of this, quote, in a twisted kind of way, the murder brought them together. Now, neither Tanya nor Jabaris testified at trial, and the defense had a pretty simple job. They were just trying to create reasonable doubt because the case was entirely circumstantial. And the defense was like, listen, they had nothing to do with this. Jabaris and Tanya liked Cheryl. They would never kill her. Tanya's attorney was like, listen, you have no evidence at all that she was involved. It was Jabaris that was making the calls from Cheryl's phone. It was Jabaris who made a confession to setting the truck on fire and finding the body. You can't even prove that my client, Tanya, was in the vehicle. So how are you going to prove that she murdered this woman? Jabaris's attorney was like, listen, my client is guilty of arson and he is guilty of concealing a death, but that is it. The state has not proven that he murdered Cheryl Miranda. In the end, both Tanya and Jabaris were found guilty of malice murder, aggravated assault, and concealing a death. And then Jabaris was also found guilty for arson. They were both given life sentences, and then Tanya got an additional 10 consecutive years, and Jabaris got an additional 20. Now, of course, both Tanya and Jabaris appealed their sentences because that is what one does. And Jabaris's was unsuccessful. They were like, no, you're just gonna hang on jail. But Tanya, she actually was successful with her appeal and she was granted a new trial based on inadmissible hearsay evidence at her trial. Basically, people are entitled legally to the opportunity to quote, confront the witnesses against them, end quote. And since Cheryl wasn't there to confront, what she wrote in her restraining order should not have been allowed in court. But the judge in the trial allowed it with the intention of showing the violent history between Cheryl and Tanya. So when she appealed, the appeals court determined that yes, the, the appeal was correct. The restraining order, like the, what am I trying to say here? The statements from Cheryl in the restraining order should not have been able to be used at Tanya's trial because Tanya could not then, you know, question, not Tanya, but Tanya's defense couldn't question Cheryl on what she wrote in these restraining orders. Once Tanya was granted a new trial, her attorney made a statement saying, and I quote, the court has upheld the right of every defendant to confront his accuser. It impacts the rights of everyone. So a 48 year old Tanya Miller was given a second trial, but at the second trial, she was again found guilty of the murder of Cheryl Miranda. And she was given a life sentence with an additional 10 consecutive years. So it was just a giant waste of time. And she got the exact same sentence. Now it looks like she did try to appeal again. And this time she was trying to say that basically the testimony from Josette, which was, you know, Cheryl's friend of three decades was technically hearsay evidence because she was saying, she was telling the court, what Cheryl had said to her, but the appeals court actually rejected this saying that Josette had proven to have a certain level of trustworthiness and then said that the hearsay law can have some exceptions in like extreme situations. And it said, quote, it is to be used very rarely and only in exceptional circumstances and only when there exist certain exceptional guarantees of trustworthiness and high degree of probativeness and necessity. So at this point, they are both in jail. Tanya and Jabaris are both in jail where it truly sounds like they belong. This is just such a tragic case, dude. Like, can you imagine being in this situation as a mother, as Tanya being a mother, can you imagine enlisting your child to do something like this for you? Like asking your son to take part in something this, this horrible? Like it's so messed up because Jabaris by all accounts had not done anything violent. Like he had no history of doing anything violent in his past. Like him and Tanya had both been arrested before, but it wasn't for anything violent. And now his mother got him wrapped up in a murder. Like how could you do that to your kid? And not to say that he has no responsibility in it because he is an adult, but I'm like, as a mother, I am a mother. I can't imagine what, I mean, I wouldn't kill anybody. I don't have that kind of, I'm not that person, but I can't imagine asking my child to do something terrible. Like it just seems fucking crazy to me. I just don't see why everyone in this case couldn't go separate ways and go on with their lives. Because don't get me wrong, I know leaving an abusive relationship is when it is most dangerous, right? But 
both Tanya and Cheryl had plans outside of each other. It wasn't just like Cheryl moving to Alabama. Tanya had plans too. She was going to go to Atlanta. She had plans to go to like truck driving school and try to adopt a kid. And don't get me wrong. Now that I know the capacity for violence this woman has, I'm glad she didn't get to adopt a kid. But why couldn't she just try to go down that path and let Cheryl move to Alabama and start over with her life? But she didn't. And now the world has lost a woman who was by all accounts fantastic. And those that loved her are gutted. And that's incredibly tragic. And with that, that my friends is the story of the tragic murder of Cheryl Miranda. I hope you found my presentation of this informative and I hope it made sense. And of course, I just want to thank you for remembering Cheryl with me today. Now, considering everything I told you throughout this video, I want to revisit the question of the day. And that was this one. What do you believe was the motive for the murder of Cheryl? Like, what do you think happened in that truck that caused them to do what they did? And two, do you believe that both of them were actually involved in the murder? And you know what? I actually have a third question for you because I know people ha have like hot takes on circumstantial cases. Do you think there was enough in this case to convict them in the first place? Let me know all your thoughts to all these questions in the comments below, because I'm really curious here. Before you leave, please don't forget to leave me a comment down below of what case you'd like to see me cover in the future. As you know, I have a long list of cases. Whenever you leave me a case suggestion, I put it on my list with your name next to it. So if I cover it, I can give you a shout out. I love looking into the cases you guys suggest because they're often cases I haven't heard of or cases that need more coverage. And I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I'd love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically, you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below for your convenience, along with a link to my membership where you get early access to non-sponsored videos, priority comment responses, things like that. And now with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday, and I hope to see you in my next video.